Hi, I'm David Santana, and this is British Literature Arguments. So, today on Brilliant Arguments, we're going to be covering John Keats and Percy Bysshe Shelley. And the argument that we're going to be covering is that the juxtaposition of To Skylark and O to Nightingale is the best way to demonstrate the difference between John Keats and Percy Bysshe Shelley as a Romantic era poet. So, before we get into analyzing the poems and talking about why it's the best way that it shows them as different Romantic era poets, let's talk a little bit about the history behind these two poets. So first we're going to start off with Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley was born on August 4th, 1792 in Field Place, Broadbridge Heath. He grew up with four younger sisters and a younger brother. His early education was actually taught to him at home, and a lot of his early childhood experiences were actually written down in a book called The Life of Percy Bysshe Shelley. It was written by Thomas Medwin, who was Shelley's cousin and a great friend. When Shelley entered Edson College, the private boarding school, he was bullied often and ended up having a rough time. Later on, he attended Oxford, but was soon kicked out due to a paper he anonymously published known as The Necessity of Atheism. He left to Scotland soon after with Harriet Westbrook, which was his current lover at the time. Shelley ended up marrying Harriet Westbrook and had kids, but later left his wife feeling unhappy and that his wife only cared for his money. He, remade, he remarried later to Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who we had covered previously in the school year. Then, on July 8th, 1822, Shelley drowned from a storm that hit his ship on the Gulf of Spiza. And that's a little bit about Percy Bysshe Shelley. So, now let's give you guys a little bit of a rundown on John Keats. John Keats was born on October 31st, 1795, in Morgate, London. He was the oldest, just like Shelley, having two younger brothers and a younger sister. He went to a private elementary school. His family was unable to afford Elton College, so he was sent to John Clark School in Enfield, which was a relatively small school. He was faced with the tragedy of his father's death at an early age of eight. Later on, Keats focused on medical studies and even got his apothecary license, but eventually decided to devote himself to poetry and literature. He ended up meeting many famous poets and making many friendships with them later on in his life. He had two love interests later on in his life, but they never ended up amounting to anything due to his illness. He had tuberculosis and decided to move to Rome. The illness ate away at his life and eventually Keats died on February 23rd, 1821. So now that you guys know a little bit about the poets, just a small summary about their lives. Let's get to the analysis of both poems, starting with To Skylark. Alright, so to save time, before we go right into the analysis of the poems, instead of summarizing the poems stanza by stanza, which will take a lot of time, I'm going to leave in the description two links to my Google Docs, where I line by line analyze and summarize what's going on in each stanza of the poem To Skylark and O to Nightingale. So if you guys want to pause the video and go check that out first, so you guys know exactly what's happening throughout the entirety of the poem, you guys can go check that out and then come back right here to the video. But right, so let's start off with a quick summary of Two Skylark. So, the poem starts off talking about the Skylark itself and saying how it never really was a bird and isn't a bird. How it's more of like a spirit and this higher power. And it talks about the bird and its scenery of it soaring in the sky and beautifully putting all its effort into singing this song which it's creating as it's flying around in the sky very happily. And so it talks more and more about the setting, which is this sunset and how the evening sky is turning purple and the bird is still soaring around, flying carelessly and singing this beautiful song. And then as it's soaring around, it starts beginning harder and harder to see the bird. And so he describes to us this imagery of like being able to see stars in the daylight and how it's really hard to see stars in the daylight because of the sun shining. And therefore, just how like we can't see the bird up in the sky soaring we're still able to hear its beautiful song and being able to hear how happy it is. And so from there on out, the author starts to compare the bird to any other thing, trying to figure out what exactly is the bird's song like to us humans. And so he compares it to a poet, he compares it to a glowing worm, he compares it to a princess, a rose, and even spring showers and them bringing up flowers and flowers blooming. And in the end, from all those comparisons, which if you guys go into the description on my Google Docs, you guys would understand more about him. After those comparisons, he finally realizes that it's incomparable. He can't compare anything to the beauty of this Skylark song and that it's creating up in the sky. It is on top of everything and nothing can beat it. 
And so he starts to question the bird and what necessarily kind of mind is behind the bird. You know, what kind of logic is able to make this beauty of a sound. And so he begins to ask these questions and starts to try to figure out what inspiration did the bird get to make this song. And so he asks a couple questions and ultimately it leads to the serious question which shifts the tone a little bit of the poem. And so he asks the bird if its inspiration was it being able to love birds of its own kind or is it inspiration from it never feeling pain before. And so this brings about this serious question wondering if the bird has ever felt pain and if its whole life has been nothing but joy and carelessly flying around the world. And so the author says that the bird must know this deep hidden truth about death and that we as humans don't necessarily know anything about death. So therefore the bird must know something about death that deep because how else would he be able to make such beautiful music? So he puts in this idea of, you know, being able to create such beauty and being able to understand something and be able to be so happy has to have knowledge of sadness and this like true despair. Yet he brings about this idea again that, you know, the bird, if it was able to exist without being annoyed or being able to feel pain and being able to love other birds of its own kind, it still never really understood the true depth of love and how love actually comes with a sad part of it and how it can be sad at times. And so he then talks about how in the end the bird is almost omnipotent, it's all knowing and it's all powerful in the sense that it knows more about us and lives in this world where he is just so joyful. And then after that, he mentions again how the song is above all and how deep down inside of humans, we have this core of sadness. He brings about this idea that, you know, in every day we talk that we have and how all of our thoughts and our ideas all have this core of sadness and these sad thoughts and sayings that we have hidden down in our messages and in our ideas and minds and how us as humans were deal with a lot of grief and pain. And so he starts to imagine this world would be like if we didn't have to deal with pain, if we were trying to live in this skylarch world of being nothing but happy. And so he starts to think about it and ultimately ends up concluding that he doesn't know if he'd be able to experience the same joy as a skylark. He starts to think about, okay, well, if I was in that world without pain, I don't know if I'd be able to be as happy as a skylark and I don't know if that would bring me necessarily joy. So he gets angry at the end and he admits that the poem that he's writing about and the skylark he's trying to describe, it's little in comparison to the skylark song. And ultimately he's not gonna be able to represent its beauty down in poetry. He won't be able to match how he is um, hearing the Skylark song into writing about it and being able to describe it perfectly. He knows that it's not enough. And so here is where he's talking about, he's asking the bird to teach him at least half of his knowledge, to give the poet, the author, at least half of the knowledge that the bird has so that the poet himself can write this beautiful poetry and be able to show the world and so that the world can listen to the same song as the Skylark, which he is listening to right now as he's trying to write the poem. And that is To a Skylark. Now that we've talked about the summary of To a Skylark, let's talk about the actual analysis of the poem. So let's start off with something as small as the rhyme scheme. So what we see in the rhyme scheme of this poem is actually A, B, A, B, B. And this can be shown from the first and any of the stanzas in the line. And I'm gonna show you guys the first stanza so you guys can see the rhyme scheme itself. So, it's consisted of 21 stanzas total, and each of them are five lines each. And in the poem, we're talking about this bird, the skylark itself. But in the poem, it is not just an ordinary bird. It is referred to as this spirit, as this thing of higher power. And this throughout the poem is shown from the beginning of the title from the bird to right away off the bat mentioned as a spirit and being shown in this setting of it flying around the world and in the sky as it sings this beautiful song that cannot compare to anything else and ultimately 
possibly even knowing this deep and ominous secret that comes with death that the author um, acknowledges that the bird might know and might show that if he knows something like that it might make more sense if he was able to sing such a beautiful song if he had this dark knowledge. So, what is Percy Bysshe Shelley's connection and interpretation of nature? Percy Bysshe Shelley had viewed nature as this double-edged sword. He saw nature as this thing that could be a beauty and full of peace, but also can be very destructive and ominous. And so this is shown throughout the poem with the skylark itself, how the skylark can be this beautiful creature that flies around the sky, producing this song that cannot be compared to anything else that us humans know, but yet at the same time might have this dark ominous secret about death and might have this other knowledge that we know nothing about even though it has not dealt with pain. And so this poem has this theme of human nature and this is seen how Shelley talks about human life and mentions how it just shows to us that we can't live in this Skylark's world. Uh, we aren't meant to be a part of it. Just how he talks about how he imagines being in this Skylark's world and without feeling pain. And he doesn't know if we were actually able to live in it, if we would be able to amount to the same amount of happiness that the bird does. So he kind of acknowledges human life as, you know, this simple thing that you can't really get rid of, but almost sees the bird as this spirit that, you know, you wish to obtain and you wish to reach that amount of happiness which is why in the end he asked the bird for some of its knowledge so that he can share to the world what he's listening to right now so that he can share to the world this view of nature and this view on human nature which is that we have to accept our lives as humans and just wish for a life such as the skylarks which is this joyful carefree life where what you produce and what you create cannot be compared to anybody else and which is above everything else. And that is my analysis of Two Skylark. So now let's move on to the summary of Ode to Nightingale. So, the summary of Ode to Nightingale. The poem starts off talking about this numb sensation that the author is feeling. It's almost being poisoned or being overtaken by drugs, sensation of numbness and not being able to feel anything. And it's talked about in the first stanza and the second how this sensation is actually not brought about anything sad or envy, but it's actually brought about how the author is so happy knowing that the nightingale exists and lives so happily that he almost feels numb from that much amount of happiness. And so he mentions the nightingale and how it lives about in the forest like a tree spirit or a nymph, which is um, a reference to Greek mythology. And it then takes a really quick turn it talks about this desire that he has to drink and to have a bit of this wine that is made from the earth itself and he begins to describe it. He describes its taste, its smell, and gives us this tactile imagery of the wine itself and how ultimately he wants the wine to alleviate him from his own world and to help him fade away into the forest. So he wants to fade away into the forest to leave behind all his worries, to leave his life and his human world and go into this life of the nightingale and being in the forest itself surrounded by nature. And so he mentions that as he's beginning to want to fade into the forest, he mentions this carefree life that the nightingale has and how it is compared to human life where he sees that in human life all we do is we sit around and listen to others complain about their bad lives and complain about things in general and how time ticks away at our bodies and how we live in this world where love and beauty do not exist. And so he takes a really dark turn talking about from the Nightingale's carefree life to the sadness about human life itself and how it reminds us that, you know, we, we live in this world that's and seems almost depressing that you know he wants to get away from it he wants to get far away from it and travel almost to the nightingale and so he realizes that the wine that he desires and wants to drink to leave his world which is almost a reference to real life where it is known that most people like to drink 
to get rid of their problems or sometimes even and take drugs in a way of coping with their day-to-day -day lives. And so he realizes that the wine and the drink that he wants is not enough to leave his physical world. And he wants to leave his physical world and mental world through his poetry. But he almost second guesses himself saying that his brain will not be able to comprehend and deal with it and be able to take him into that world with his poetry. So he then enters this trance-like state where he is in the forest with the bird itself. And while he's in the forest, he's surrounded by pitch black darkness. And that's because the forest is covered in these giant trees and all this forgery that is blocking the sunlight from up above. So it's really dark and he can't see anything. And so he's in this forest smelling around to all these beautiful scents that he's starting to smell. And he begins to take guesses as to what flowers or what thing is producing that smell. And it seems almost like a fun game to him. He doesn't seem to be stressed out or worried that he's in the dark not knowing what's near him or what he's smelling, he seems to almost enjoy it and have this like childlike feature to it, trying to guess what it is. And so after guessing the smells and the things he was smelling, he begins to listen to the darkness. He begins to just stand there and quietly try to focus his ears on what he's hearing. And he listens long enough to the point where he refers to him being in the dark forest and just listening to things as death. He says that he almost gets comfortable with death and that he would be perfectly fine if death were to take his writing and put it into the air. Almost saying that, you know, he would be perfectly fine with dying right now, saying that almost this is a perfect time to die because he would want to be in this forest listening to the nightingale singing and it would continue even after his body had perished and turned into dirt and soil and the bird would still be happily in the forest singing. And he sees that as a comforting image and a comforting thought that, you know, dying is this scary thing, but he'd be perfectly okay with it right now, being in this world of the nightingale. And so he ends up calling the bird immortal. He talks about how the song that he's hearing himself right now from the nightingale has actually been heard throughout history, has been heard by many people before him. And he mentions this by saying that ancient people before him have heard the song and even examples such as Ruth from the Hebrew Bible and the book of Ruth has probably heard the song while she was working on the field. And even as crazy as saying that in this fantasy world where the bird is almost trapped in the ship and escapes with magic, that the bird is able to escape and enter this dangerous sea, all abandoned and alone, and still be able to share its beautiful song. And so when he begins to talk about this fantasy world and how the bird escapes and is abandoned in the sea, that word abandoned becomes a trigger for him. Almost like when you're having a bad dream and like you were to fall off a cliff and boom, you'd wake up. That was like your trigger that caused you to almost in a sense, leave that dream or trance-like state and come back into the real world. And so he realizes that once he mentions that word of abandoned, he almost wakes up. And that can mean to us that either he has dealt with being abandoned himself or that is a sensitive word for him. And so he is almost angry at the fact that, you know, his mind couldn't keep him in that dream of being with the nightingale and being able to be in its world for long enough. It eventually gave up. And so at this point, he begins to say goodbye to the bird. He begins to realize that, you know, he cannot stay in that world forever and is back to the real world, which he wanted to get far away from. And so he says goodbye to the bird again as the bird is flying farther and farther away and the bird's song is slowly fading. And as the song of the bird is slowly fading away, he begins to question whether he's actually in the real world right now. He questions if the dream that he had or that dream like trance was the real world or a dream. And he wonders if what he's seeing right now is actually a dream or if it's not and it's actually the real world. And so he's left with this puzzled image and thought of what is real 
and what did I just experience? All right, so now that we're done with the summary of Oates and Nightingale, let's get right into the analysis. So again, we can start off with something simple as the rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme in this poem is actually A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, E. And this is seen in the first and all eight stanzas of the poem, which consists of 10 lines each. So, of course, this poem is about the nightingale. And in this poem, the nightingale is a bird, but it is also seen as this immortal bird, in which through its song and being able to hear its song lives on forever. And so the bird to the author is this escape from reality, that the nightingale's world and the way that the nightingale lives is a way for the author to escape his own real life problems as a human being and his world, which is, he seems to see as full of this constant complaint and constant sadness. And so again, here we see this theme of human nature and how we live in this world that is full of sadness and this grief and complaint. And yet we want to escape it so badly and leave it behind. We want to go somewhere else and sometimes end up not even liking our own world. And this is seen in this poem as the author is desperate to find that escape. At first we see him desperate to get a drink and drink this earth wine as a way for him to immediately leave, focusing on this drug to be able to uplift his own mind and physical sense to the point where he doesn't feel that he's in his world. And he then tries his own poetry and tries to escape this reality through his writing and his poems, but is not sure that his mind can keep up. So ultimately he goes into this trance-like dream in which he's in the Nightingale's world, which is this amazing beauty of this darkness that he's able to become comfortable with and peaceful with, which is something that he wants and wasn't able to get out of his own world. And in the end, he ultimately questions whether he was actually in it or whether his own real life is a dream itself. And so we see also again this connection to nature. And John Keats's interpretation and connection to nature was similar to Wordsworth and how they both saw nature as this holy thing almost. They worshipped it and constantly talked about it. They didn't see it as a bad thing and mainly held it to this high regard. And that is seen in this poem and how John Keats holds the bird to being this immortal thing that lives on, to being this creature they can create, this song that has lived on for years and can even exist in this fantasy world as we see in the last few lines of the poem. And so John Keats in this poem talks more about how the bird itself helps him escape his reality and how the bird is sort of this freeing thing to him from his natural world. So now that we've talked about both poems and analyzed both poems, let's get right into the... So now that we've talked about both poems and the analysis for both poems, let's actually move on to the document of the day, which should be in the drawer. All right, so now that we've actually talked about both poems, summarized them and analyzed them, let's go to the mystery document and see what's holding out for us today before we compare and contrast both these poems and why they are the best way to show the difference between John Keats and Percy Bysshe Shelley as Romantic Era poets. So let's go right into that document. Okay, so now let's go into the drawer and find out what the mystery document for today is. What is this? A note written by myself. Hmm. It, uh, it says subscribe to the Little Swag Gaming YouTube channel. Well, I'm sorry guys, I seem to have opened the wrong drawer, but I mean, while you guys are at it, if you guys want to go help me out and subscribe to my channel, it'd be really appreciated if you guys are enjoying these videos so far and enjoying the content I'm making. Well, I guess it's time to go open the other drawer. All right, hopefully this should be the right drawer. Ah, of course it is. All right. All right, so this is the mystery document for today, the actual mystery document for today. And it's actually an excerpt from a post written by K. Jen Ustiok from the environmental history resources. So let's read a little bit about it. So romanticism was an intellectual and artistic movement that originated in the second half of the 18th century. It was a reactionary response against the scientific rationalization of nature during the enlightenment, 
commonly expressed in literature, music, painting, and drama. But it was not simply a response to the rationalism of the Enlightenment, but also a reaction against the material changes in society, which accompanied the emerging and expanding industrial capitalism in the late 18th century. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, here we go. This was regarded as an undesirable and leading degradation to humans. According to Romantics, the solution was back to nature, because nature was seen as pure and a spiritual source of renewal. It was also a way out of the fumes of the growing industrial centers for the new industrial rich. Inspired by the works of romantic authors and poets such as Wordsworth, Keats, and Shelley, they hoped on the newly developed railways and traveled to the Lake District. Well, this actually has to do a lot with what we're about to talk about right now, which is the comparison of these two pieces and why it shows the best difference between Percy Bysshe Shelley and John Keats as Romantic Era poets. And yes, the Romantic Era movement was a lot based on nature. It mainly focused around nature itself and nature was a huge part of it. And that is gonna coincide right with what we're about to talk about. So now that we're done summarizing and analyzing both these poems, let's get into the actual comparison of the two. And right off the bat, the first thing that we can talk about that compares the two of them is the way they are written and the way they address the topic of each bird in the poem. And so in To Skylark, we see the rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, B. And in Ode to Nightingale, we see this more complex rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, E, C, D, E. So right off the bat, we already see this more complex, mature theme in Ode to Nightingale. And in To Skylark, we see these simple rhyme scheme of 21 stanzas and five lines each in each stanza. And in Ode to Nightingale, we have eight stanzas with 10 lines each. So in Ode to Nightingale, we have these deeper thoughts inside the stanzas, but they are separate themselves. And whereas To Skylark has this multitude of stanzas in which this maybe idea or image is like scattered across. And so also a big difference is how they discuss the topic of each bird. So in To Skylark, there is a lot of use of similes in which they compare the bird to other things and the bird's song to a lot of other things in real life. Whereas O to Nightingale mainly just states things about the birds and describes it, such as how it states that it's just immortal and how its song is immortal. And it states how it describes and how the author sees it in the forest. While as to Skylark mainly describes these type of feelings and this type of like aroma and sense of being in that moment with the skylark up in the sky as it's singing and flying around and so off the bat we see two skylark has more of a simile and use of these comparisons to sh try to give us this idea of that feeling being with the skylark while o to nightingale it's mainly more about the author and less addressing the bird all right and another big comparison between the two is mainly the birds themselves and to skylark the bird signifies this giant spirit who is like all-knowing in a sense and that it knows and lives its life carefree and joyously but also knows this deep hidden truth about death while as the bird in Ocean Nightingale is mainly just this immortal idea of the bird and its song living out through history and the bird is more thought of as a, a key and like this doorway to exiting the real world and kind of putting yourself in this world where you're relaxed and calm and peaceful. And so To Skylark and O to Nightingale have these two very similar themes about human nature, but they both convey two different ideas. To Skylark has this idea of being okay with human nature and, you know, and understanding that this day-to-day -day life that we have to live, which can be sad or depressing from time to time, is okay, but still trying to achieve a happiness that the Skylark has, but also understanding that we are human and we may not be able to achieve that. And that's why at the end of Skylark, we see the person or the author just asking for a bit of knowledge so that he can share this idea with the world and how, you know, we have to maybe live through this terrible world and stuff like that, but we can still keep our hopes high and still try to attain such things, even if they are impossible, which is impossible like reaching the joy of the skylark. While as O to Nightingale, we see more of like this reference to day-to-day -day life as this reminder that we live in this terrible world where all we do is listen about people complaining and where time slowly eats away at us and we just want to get away from it. 
and we want to escape with however way possible and some people choose the route of the wine such as the author initially did some people try to do it the way that he also tried which is through his poetry but had difficulty doing it so because of their human brain and ultimately being confused as to what really is life just like the author in the end is questioning whether the experience he just had with the nightingale was truly a dream or if the real world he's in right now is the dream itself and so overall the biggest comparison between the two that shows the difference between john keats and percy bish shelley as romantic era poets is nature itself and nature just like we had talked about with the mystery document is huge in romanticism and romantic poetry and it conveys a lot of poetry a lot of themes and a lot of messages that were in this time period and in these two poems there is this comparison of nature this idea of this spirit and this um all-knowing thing that has both a deep and dark secret but also this joyous carefree life to this idea of this bird which signifies this escape from reality because you cannot handle itself you cannot handle your life so you want to get away from it and so we see these two ideas that signify and reflect back on both the author's perspectives on nature and how different they are John Keats worships more of it. He holds it to a high degree, just as how he's worshiping it in the poem as this beautiful fantasy world that he can escape to, like his paradise. While Percy Bysshe Shelley is looking at nature and knows the beauty, and he knows that there's something lurking behind it, but at the same time knows that we are human, that you know we may not be able to amount to the same degree as nature. And so the only thing we can do is try to share that with the world. And that is the main difference between these two. And this is why I believe these two poems are the best way to demonstrate the difference between John Keats and Percy Bysshe Shelley as Romantic Era poets. I hope you guys enjoyed. I know it's a long video, but I had to take my time with it and make sure you guys understood what I was talking about. So if you guys want to know more about this Brit literature, you guys can make sure to check some of the references I have down below, which helped me out with learning some of the information I needed for this video. And also make sure to check out both the links to my Google Docs so you guys can see my line by line and stanza uh, analysis and summary of both these poems. So, hope you guys enjoyed. That's going to be it. Thanks for watching. Britlet Arguments.